All right. Oh, actually. Yeah. Well, I think. No, this is. This is why a lot of people are doing school teaching. All right. Thank you. Hello. Welcome to the kickoff event for our 13th annual Summer Lakes Region Forum, sponsored by the Winthrop Library Foundation and Winthrop Area Federal Credit Union. For more information on supporting the foundation that helps make these events possible, please visit winthroplibrary.org. For more information on other speakers coming later this summer, you can visit our website at baileylibrary.org. Tonight we are so pleased to welcome Maine's 50th Secretary of State, the Honorable Shanna Bellows. Shanna lives right down the road in Manchester and grew up in Ellsworth. She earned a bachelor's degree in international politics and economics from Middlebury College in Vermont. After college, she served as an AmeriCorps volunteer, working to promote the educational and economic empowerment of youth at Nashville's largest public housing project. Bellows is the former executive director of Maine Holocaust and Human Rights Center and Learning Works in Portland. After representing District 14 in the Maine Senate, she was selected by the state legislature to serve as Maine's Secretary of State. She is the 50th person and the first woman to serve. Yes. Please welcome Shanna Bellows. Thank you. I am so honored to be the kickoff uh, speaker for your summer series and so thrilled to be back in person with my friends here in Winthrop. And um, when I was asked to speak, I was asked to speak uh, about, in part, my own life story, but also celebrating women in leadership um, in Maine and beyond. And so I thought as I told my story, I would talk a little bit about some of the women, uh, both in history, uh, living and past, uh, who influenced the trajectory uh, of my career and my work in civil rights. So I grew up in Hancock, Maine, and we were poor. I grew up without electricity or running water until I was in the fifth grade. Um, my parents, my father was a carpenter and an activist. Uh, at the time, in the early 80s, uh, he was protesting nuclear power and concerned about the potential for nuclear war. And so I, being a voracious reader <laughs> at a very young age, read all of his pamphlets and all of the books uh, about the threats of nuclear war. And I would have these nightmares <laughs> as a small child in the 1980s <laughs> uh, about nuclear war. And I would wake up in the middle of the night, and I would go downstairs. My dad would be on the couch reading. And I would say, Dad, is there going to be a nuclear war? And he would say, not tonight, Shanna. <laughs> and that was enough. I could go back upstairs and fall asleep and be OK. But so I can't tell you how meaningful it was as a young girl when Samantha Smith of Manchester wrote her infamous letter to the leaders of uh, the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, and the United States, Ronald Reagan and uh, Yuri Andropov. Um, I'm going to, I mispronounced that, but forgive me. And received a reply back from the leader of the Soviet Union and an invitation to visit the USSR on a peace mission and to share that uh, message of peace and nuclear disarmament uh, with our international leaders. As a young girl, just a couple of years younger than Samantha Smith was at the time, um, that was extraordinary. That was revelatory. Uh, that one person with one action could make such an impact on our world, on something that was so important. So Samantha Smith was really one of the first Maine women who inspired girls, who inspired me as a young girl to think about how I might be able to make a difference in this world someday. Um, so I grew up, uh, wonderful parents. Uh, I grew up in the town of Hancock. I went to Hancock Grammar School and then Ellsworth High School. 
And I will say another woman that was really important in my life was uh, my mother. So not only was my father an activist, but my mother also had a deep passion for the environment and for civil rights. Uh, she served, my father served on the town select board, my mother served on the town planning board. And one of the big fights in the town at that time, again, this is the 1980s, was uh, the fight to save a bald eagle's nest uh, in the town from development because it was the 1980s and our bald eagles were endangered at the time, which now that species has rebounded. So I really credit my mother as well for showing me the ways in which you could navigate systems and bring people together and have successes. Um, she saved that bald, not just my mother, but many people in that town, <laughs> saved that bald eagle's nest and did so much to protect um, our environment in Hancock, Maine. So I went to Middlebury College graduated from Middlebury, and I just gave a speech yesterday to Deerago State, Boys and Girls State, is now unified. Uh, Maine was one of the first states in the country, if not the first, to bring uh, that to, uh, to bring uh, students together for Deerago State in a unified state. And so I was speaking to these students at Deerago State uh, 30 years after I had done Deerago State myself, and I reminisced about my student debt. I had tremendous student debt uh, graduating from Middlebury College in 1997. It was just over $30,000, which at the time felt enormous. And so my first job out of college, I wanted to make money. I wanted to pay off my student debt. I took a job in economics consulting, a firm called Economist Incorporated in Washington, DC. And I hated it. <laughs> I was paying down my student debt, um, but I wasn't doing what I loved. And so two years later, I decided to follow a passion and went into the Peace Corps uh, and then decided to do AmeriCorps following that. And that set me um, on my path into social justice and civil rights. I ended my AmeriCorps service and um, came home to work for another powerful Maine woman. Shelly Pingree was a farmer, was a housewife, was a knitter, a businesswoman and a state senator who was really passionate about prescription drug reform and clean elections. And she decided to run for United States Senate. And so I came home to Maine after AmeriCorps to work for Shelley because when I read her platform, when I um, learned what she had sponsored in the state Senate, I thought that is someone that I want to support. And she didn't win that US Senate race against Susan Collins in 2002. Uh, but I felt like I learned a tremendous amount watching her campaign and meeting the people that volunteered for her and worked for her. So it was really a tremendous um, and important experience in my career development uh, doing that work. Um, here in the state, I was employed by the Maine Democratic Party. I ran the Get Out the Vote efforts in my home county of Hancock County um, during that time. So then after that, uh, 2002 was a tough year economically. I applied for more than 100 jobs. I know because I kept a list. <laughs> and I only heard back um, from three. And of those three people who interviewed me, one did not make me a job offer. I was crushed. And two did. But of the two organizations that offered me an interview and then made a job offer to me, one of them was the American Civil Liberties Union Washington Legislative Office. <gasps> What a gift. When I was a kid, I had a copy of the Bill of Rights and the preamble to the United States Constitution um, as posters on my bedroom wall. <laughs> I love the Bill of Rights. And of course, the ACLU's mission is defense of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So that's how I entered service um, into the ACLU. After a couple of years at the national level, my dad used to call me and say, when are you coming home, Sean? When are you coming home to Maine? And he called me and he said, you know, the ACLU of Maine is looking for an executive director. And after immense pressure from him and my mother, <laughs> I decided to apply. And I was hired and came home to Maine to run the ACLU of Maine at 29. And that's where some other women made a huge difference in my life. So 2005 was the year of Maine Won't Discriminate. What a phenomenal grassroots campaign for equality uh, for all people in our state. Um, 
and it was the anti-discrimination referendum uh, to prohibit discrimination against lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, uh, questioning individuals in our state in education, employment, credit, and housing. We won statewide, we won big. Everyone had bumper stickers, Maine won't discriminate. And we should be so proud of that work. So a week later, Betsy Smith, head of Equality Maine, calls me and said, how would you like to work on marriage equality in our state? How would you like to make sure that we have the freedom to marry in our state? And I said, yes, sign me up. It was a group of women, Betsy Smith, head of Equality Maine, Mary Bonato, a legendary attorney who has argued before the United States Supreme Court and permanently shaped the um, trajectory of our civil rights law in our country. Um, a lawyer who lives here in Maine, although she practices in Boston at GLAD. Pat Peard, a lawyer at Bernstein Schur, who had been on the board of directors of Equality Maine, had been involved in GLAD for years, um, had a keen legal and political mind. It was these women, with support from Sarah Standiford at the time, who was head of Maine Women's Lobby, and um, various staffers um, uh, at Maine Women's Lobby who joined that coalition over time. Laura Harper, um, an organizer and advocate. Kate Knox. So this team started to meet on a weekly basis. And there were men too. Matt Weenan with Equality Maine. He became uh, Maine's House Majority Leader. Zach Hyden, Legal Director for the ACLU of Maine. Tremendous, tremendous leaders. Darling Huntress. We had this great group of teams. We worked on that campaign for seven years. In part, we started having public meetings in basements just like this one, in libraries all across the state, in churches, in community town halls. And we built a coalition. It wasn't just us, it was grassroots. The coalition came together, people rose up, people who had been involved in me went discriminate. Um, but I'll never forget that leadership that Betsy Smith, Mary Bonato, and Pat Peard showed in having the vision. This is the path. This is the plan. This is where we're moving. 2009, we brought a bill before the legislature. The legislature passed it. Then there was the people's veto, and it was overturned at the ballot. And the day after that loss, many of us stood on the city hall steps in Portland, and we said, we're going back. We're not giving up. We're not taking this loss for granted. And of course, in 2012, the Maine people stood up again against discrimination for freedom. So the most momentous and important campaign I've ever been a part of was the marriage equality campaign over those seven years from 2005 to 2012. And it was those women who helped shape my leadership and showed me the power of coalition, the power of building grassroots, the power of trusting in people, um, and the power of strategic planning and vision for the future and what could be, even when other folks tell you to give up or not to, it's too soon, or, or don't try. So that brought me to 2014, 2013. Senator Susan Collins was up for re-election, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for her work ethic. Um, I think very few people in Congress work harder than she does. Um, she is tireless. And uh, there are some issues in which we agree. Um, uh, her work on diabetes, on, in healthcare in certain areas. But there are many issues with which we disagreed. And folks were saying, who's going to run? Who's going to run? Who's going to run? No one tapped me on a shoulder. <laughs> no one in a back room said, this would be a good idea. This is what you should do. You're the right person. <laughs> no, I foolishly volunteered. <laughs> but as I tell students, you have to dare to dream big, even if, it, even if it's a fool's, dream, fool's errand, um, even if you lose big. You have to take that fear. It's not that you don't have fear, but you have to take that fear and still dare to take that next step, to reach for whatever it is that you think you want to reach for. And so I ran for US Senate. I walked across the state from Holton to Kittery. Um, that was phenomenal in itself. Some people in this room met me at different places along the way or supported me in different places along the way. And of course, I lost. 
But I had good role models, right? Shelley Pingree had lost and then gone on to lead Common Cause and then gone on to be such a distinguished member of Congress. Um, and I had cheerleaders and champions and people who encouraged me um, to stay involved and stay engaged. I'll fast forward to 2016. Our state senator um, at that time, Earl McCormick, retired. And this time I did get a call from someone in the party who said, you should run. You'd be great. <laughs> and so I did. I knocked on doors here in Winthrop and across the district. I met a lot of people. And in 2016, in a year that Donald Trump won this state Senate district, I also won this state Senate district. And I think that's a testament in part to Mainers, who vote the person, not the party, in part to grassroots organizing, organizing that I had learned on the marriage campaign, that simple act of knocking on a door and introducing yourself and saying, what issue matters most to you? What do you really care about? That has so much power. Um, even today in politics. So serving in the state Senate, again, incredible female role models. Kathy Breen chairs the Appropriations Committee in the state Senate. Rebecca Millett was a veteran state senator uh, who was chairing the Education Committee. Although when we entered into the state Senate, we were in the minority, so they were serving on those committees, not chairing them. But they, and Eloise Vitelli, who's in the Maine Women's Hall of Fame and is now currently the Senate Majority Leader, um, they were mentors in what it takes to be a strong state senator, what's important about serving our constituents, um, how to build those relationships, how to pass legislation, how to move legislation through the process. So I was fortunate enough, you can't, you can't serve in the legislature and not have a full-time job unless you have personal wealth or you're retired. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so that is something that should change at some point. Um, but I was fortunate enough to get hired by the Holocaust and Human Rights Center to be their executive director. And tonight I'm wearing a bracelet. And this bra bracelet belonged to Holocaust survivor uh, Zizette Larson. And Zizette uh, was just a child um, when uh, the Nazis took over first Germany and then other countries in Eastern Europe. And she was, her family was Jewish. So at first, they sent her to Catholic boarding school um, in hiding with a pseudonym. She was desperately homesick. So she begged to be released from boarding school to come home on Easter holiday. Uh, on the Catholic Christian Easter, Easter holiday. And on Easter Sunday, the Nazis um, invaded her home and took her and her parents to a concentration camp. Her parents were murdered. She survived. She survived, um, and she came to Maine. She fell in love with a meaner named Stephen. Um, she had a daughter. She had a happy life here in our state. Um, and the Holocaust and Human Rights Center of Maine um, is a museum here in Kennebec County on the campus of the University of Maine at Augusta. If you haven't been there, you should absolutely go. And it's dedicated to the memories of people like Zazette, of survivors and their stories, and both how they survived, what happened to them, so that we never forget but also what they contributed to our state when they moved here, when they built community here as teachers, as leaders um, here in Maine. And so Zizat and other leaders at the Holocaust and Human Rights Center helped me understand how important our history is and how fragile our institutions are, how fragile our democracy is, how fragile our civil rights are, what happens when people are targeted with violence? What happens when people are demonized? Um, so I want to talk a little bit about my race for, for, for Secretary of State. Being a state senator was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And we were able to do some really great things. Um, in my first job out of college, a year had gone by, and we all received raises, and I was secretly dating a guy at the firm. So go home, we're all excited, we go out for a drink or whatever. 
And I learned that the men in the firm, all of who we'd all been hired fresh out of college, same exact level of education, same experience, same amount of time at the firm. The men had received a higher raise than the women at the firm. And I never would have known but for the fact that I was dating one of them. So I went to Human Resources and I was like, hey, <laughs> this is unfair. And I advocated for a retroactive raise um, for the women in, in the organization. This is not ancient history, however. Fast forward to another job. Four of us are hired on the same day for the same role um, at uh, working in the same exact capacity. A year goes by. I'm not dating anybody at the organization. <laughs> but we go out for drinks, as coworkers do. And I learned that the gentleman that I'm sharing an office with, who started on the same day as me, is making significantly more money than I am. And believe me, I was, I was working very hard. <laughs> so I went to my boss and advocated for a raise and was successful. But I mention this now because as a state senator, Senator Kathy Breen introduced legislation to require organizations to pay men and women equally, to make it a violation of state law if it didn't happen, to permit employees to discuss compensation so employees could affirmatively find out if there were these variations in compensation. And we got that passed when I was a state senator. I was a co-sponsor. It came to my committee, which I was chairing, Labor and Housing. We got it passed, signed into law by Governor Janet Mills, um, another trailblazing woman as the first female governor in our state. And that type of legislation changes lives. How do we know? Because the Bangor Daily News repeat, reported um, about a year ago about um, women in healthcare and mental health care uh, in my home county of Hancock County, um, who realized she was making significantly less than her male peers and sued under our new law <laughs> and was retroactively awarded equal compensation. So I share this because it was a testament to how at the state level we can make real change and 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 as a state senator, it was such a privilege to get to work collaboratively with other leaders and with Governor Mills to make that happen. But Secretary of State, you know, I mentioned the fragility of democracy, working at the Holocaust and Human right, Rights Center, um, thinking about how the right to vote is fundamental to everything else that we care about that everything that we have achieved in civil rights and environmental justice, it's often started with grassroots movements, it started with people in communities, but the laws matter. The laws and the policies of the government have a huge influence on people's lives. So that right to vote is fundamental to everything else. Free, fair, and secure elections are really, truly important, regardless of what you care about. So 2020 rolls around. And I, I knew the Secretary of State uh, position was going to be open, and I really wanted to run. So I talked to some friends early in the year, and they said, don't do it. <laughs> You'll never win. The guy that's running has it all sewn up. And oh, by the way, you know, it, it made some legitimate arguments about how effective I had been able to be in the State Senate and that opportunity. So I was like, OK, you're right, you're right. Six months go by. It's, it's June or July. And I was like, ugh, I'd really like to run for Secretary of State. I mentioned it to a different group of people that I care about. And they were like, are you crazy? By this time, there are more people in the race. You're never going to win. One of those guys has definitely got it all locked up. Um, you know, don't run. So I was like, OK, OK. And, and I share this because I always tell young people that you, you can't, sometimes we ourselves are the ones holding ourselves back, right? Like those fears were getting in my way. Um, so about a week before the November election, a friend called me, um, and she said, how has it been 200 years and still we do not have a female Secretary of State? <laughs> how is it that there are no women running for Secretary of State and we just celebrated Maine's bicentennial? And I said, you know, <laughs> I really wanted to run, but... I didn't think I could win. People suggested I shouldn't do it. And she said, what? You should run for Secretary of State, and I will help you. 
And that was what it took. I said, let me think about it. I thought about it. And I knew in my heart of hearts, um, getting to stand up and implement the framework of the Constitution, our elections, the, the, the foundational element of our constitutional rights as Secretary of State was, would be something that would be truly, truly um, wonderful to do. So that, um, I, I, it was a ranked choice voting election. I was, I was fortunate enough to win and sworn in as Maine's first female Secretary of State on January 4th. And it was two da days after um, my grandmother's 102nd, no, it was 2021, 101st birthday. <laughs> um, she had been born in 1920. And 1920, of course, was the year that women in this country gained the right to vote. So to be sworn into office a um, hundred years later, after women received the right to vote, um, was, was truly an honor. But it shows that we've made progress in our country, right? That meaning of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, when it was written, it didn't apply to everyone. Right? It applied to property owning white males. And over time, it is we, the people, who have come together in movement building. We, the people, our ancestors in the Civil War, we, the people who have fought for what's in the 14th Amendment, the concept of equal protection under the law for all people. We have given it meaning and more meaning over time. But we're not done yet. And in fact, some days, we're sliding back. Some days, it feels like those rights are being taken away. And so I think about those leaders in my lifetime. I think about Samantha Smith. I think about my mother. I think about Zazette Larson. I think about um, leaders who are still doing great social justice work, like Betsy Smith and Mary Bonato and Shelley Pingree. Um, and Kathy Breen and Rebecca Millette and Eloise Vitelli. And even in those darkest moments of despair, even when uh, you watch the January 6th hearings or the recent uh, school shooting, when you see some of the really difficult moments in our country and recognize that there are people who are being harmed right now, there are people living in fear right now, um, I draw hope and I draw sustenance and a dedication to keep trying to fight for full equality, opportunity, liberty, the rights under the Constitution and the Bill of Rights to make those promises real. And as Secretary of State, I have the great privilege of overseeing Maine's elections and our elections. We should be so proud. Maine's elections are free, fair, and secure. We're one of the best states in the nation for voter participation. In 2020, we ranked third in the nation for voter participation. We do so many things right. In Maine, we're one of only two states in the country, Maine and Vermont, where you never, no Maine citizen ever loses the right to vote for any reason. Every Mainer, 18 years or older, has the fundamental right to vote. We have things that are time tested and enacted into law before I was born, like same day voter registration passed in 1973 by a Republican legislature um, that allows people to register and cast their ballot on election day. We have no excuse absentee voting where you can vote 30 days prior to the election um, via absentee for any reason, whether you're a working parent, um, uh, or a senior, a person with a disability, or you just feel like getting it done and getting it out of the way so they stop sending you mailers in the mail. <laughs> um, so for all of those reasons, we make voting accessible. It is extraordinarily secure. Um, and we should be really proud of that. We should be really proud of the work that we've done in Maine um, to strengthen and support our democracy. So I'm going to stop there and take questions, if that's permitted. And I'll, I'll repeat the questions um, through the mic so that uh, people listening at home um, can hear the question as well as the response. Um, but I, I share my story with a sense of deep gratitude and with a sense that I 
and, and I know this is such a cliche, but we all stand on the shoulders of the people who came before us. We stand on the shoulders of the people who paved the way um, for us to be our best selves and do the work that we do today. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Questions? <laughs> yeah. How did, how did you find out they were making more than you? Because people don't ask those questions. You obviously did. How did you do that? <laughs> Tactfully. So the question is, how did I find out that these people were making, that the men yeah. at my organi two organizations um, were making more money than I was for the same exact work? Um, and honestly it was by accident right so i was in a romantic relationship with somebody else at the or that the firm that i was working at and oh, and that's you know i never it never occurred to me but i knew how much he was getting for a raise because i was excited he was he had thoughts you know we were talking about our pay because it had just happened for all of us and that's that's how i discovered that and then similarly, it never occurred to me with a second organization that there would be a pay disparity um, within the organization. And you know, my boss had a somewhat reasonable answer. He said, well, you're, you know, your, your coworker has significant more professional experience than you do and has an advanced degree. You only have a bachelor's degree and you're a lot younger. You haven't worked as long. You know, I made the counter argument that we were hired for the same work and, and doing the same job. But I think some of these habits are just so ingrained and institutionalized, and that's where I think the law can make a big difference for two reasons. I think, and I'm not an attorney, by the way. I joke that I, used, that I played one on TV, but my student debt was so significant after college, I was not ready to go on to graduate school. <laughs> um, and I've been able to do a lot of things that I want to do without that. But. Um, I think the law does two things. One, it makes it actively illegal. So with my, you know, this was not an illegal thing for these companies to do. If Human Resources had said, we're sorry, you're not going to get a retroactive raise, and neither are the other women, legally they could have done that back in um, 1998. Um, because the Equal Pay Act, uh, the Paycheck, Paycheck Fairness Act that Congress passed, passed um, much later than that. Um, and here in Maine, um, similarly, we didn't have those paycheck protections. But there's also a cultural awareness as well, right? When we start to tell our stories of the experiences that we've had professionally, then hopefully that inspires other women in the workforce to start to ask some of those questions or start to wonder, could this be happening to me as well? But what's unfortunate is I know that with my mother's generation and my grandmother's generation, those pay disparities get locked into your social security and your retirement earnings. Pensions and social securities are based on your lifetime earnings. So if that discrimination um, starts in your first job in the workforce and then gets perpetuated over time, that unfortunately has lifelong consequences. So that's why I was so glad that we were able to take action at the state level uh, in the state legislature and have Governor Mills sign that into law. That was a really important piece of legislation, but also hopefully helped raise awareness. And I tell my story about pay discrimination wherever I can, because sometimes um, women of my generation or younger think that some of these aspects of discrimination are in the past. And I think sometimes we get a little too comfortable with rights that we take for granted, with rights that we have won, you know, 10, 15, 20, 40 years ago. But I think what history demonstrates is that nothing is ever permanently won or lost, right? Uh, the moments of darkness will have moments of light that will come, but only if we work for them. And, and the progress that we make needs to be defended um, as well as, as secured. Um, yeah. Uh, well, first, I'd, I'd like to thank you for going over what you did with grassroots campaigns for the, the Marriage Equality Act. What was it, nine years? Yeah, uh, it was seven years, from 2005 to 2012. You know, if you're 
just going about your, your life, and you know there's an issue, and then, and then somehow some law is passed, and you, you almost take that action for granted, and you don't realize that there are people who have dedicated their life for years to get the awareness of this raise so that something can happen. And I, I think that's, you know, that, that's an interesting thing that most people don't, aren't really aware of. And I came to, came to those campaigns late because the non-discrimination fights, the 2005 Maine Won't Discriminate Win, came on the heels of a couple of decades of organizing by people like Pat Peard and Betsy Smith and Mary Bonato before me, um, and by um, campaigns that lost on the ballot in the 90s. Um, so... It's, you know, there are leaders in our movements, um, whether it's whatever movement that you pick, you know, you think about Mary Bonato, for example, has spent her entire life advocating for LGBTQIA equality. And she has been part of many, many um, struggles for equality uh, for the LGBTQIA community um, over time. and really th throughout a career. But you're absolutely right. And, and I try to, when I talk to young people who are really passionate about something, it's like, don't give up the first time you lose. Because so often, you bring a bill to the legislature, and it, it gets demolished. It gets laughed at. It gets you know shoved under the rug. Um, and sometimes it doesn't come back right away. Sometimes there's planning, there's work, you have to change hearts and minds, and you can only come back you know, five years later, but then you win. And there was another issue um, that happened when I was in the legislature, um, and maybe not everyone in the audience is going to agree on this, but it was important to me. Um, uh, Panama is a country where abortion was illegal when I was in the Peace Corps. And uh, I, I had someone I was I was close to, um, almost died because of an illegal abortion, and so I saw um, the consequences from my perspective of what happens when abortion is made illegal. And having grown up in an era of Roe v. Wade, I had taken access to reproductive health care as a natural part of medical care for granted, and. So that really changed how I felt about access um, to reproductive, reproductive health care. Um, there was a bill in the legislature to provide equal access um, through uh, Medicaid uh, to reproductive health care, including abortion, in 2005. And it got unanimously defeated, unanimously at the time. Beth Edmonds was Senate president. It was her bill. She was the Senate president, and she had brought it. And the legislature wasn't ready for it. Uh, that was another bill that, that passed when I was a state senator. We were able to secure that funding so that anyone can choose whatever health care they choose um, and make sure that that's part of their health care. And that was something I was really proud to get to work on. But that took 13, 14 years um, before that finally happened. So again, when you think about, I, can, I, could, I could pick a dozen issues. <laughs> and sometimes they go the other way, right? Um, it's something I don't agree with, but conservatives have been working on public funding for religious schools, which I don't agree with, for decades. When I was at the ACLU, we were fighting bills, we were defeating bills that would have required Maine to fund religious schools. Um, when I was at the ACLU for all those years from 2005 um, to 2013, and we always won. And now, you know, just yesterday, the Supreme Court ruled that mean um, if Maine fi funds private schools, it must also fund religious schools. Make no mistake, that has been worked on for decades by people who support that. And again, so I, I can give you examples from both sides. And I think what's really important is if you believe in something, if you have passion in something, is to stay with it and not to get discouraged. Mm -hmm. And some things we find unanimous agreement, right? So and some problems we solve permanently. Remember the ozone hole of the 1980s and acid rain? I mean, we haven't solved them permanently, but we certainly have made great strides. The bald eagles are back. <laughs> I, I, I see the news about the, um, 
voting laws in other states and the crazy people who want to run for Secretary of State so they can make sure that people can carry guns to polling places and so on. And there's a little part of me that says, well, it's okay, I'm, I'm safe in Maine, and Shen is there taking care of our elections. <laughs> but how much does this worry you when you look at the nation and surely you go to national meetings with other secretaries of state i mean my word some of them went through hell a couple of years yeah. ago i mean what do you feel that with these hearings hopefully we're starting to crack this this oh my word i don't know i i, I worry about elections in other states, but I don't live there and I can't do anything about that, you know? The question is about elections in other states and the elevation of people who uh, would deny the legitimate results of elections, election deniers and positions of power, and the violence that's happening in other states uh, directed toward state and local election officials. Make no mistake, we are in a very dangerous moment for our democracy. And the public hearings that are happening in Congress about the events of January 6th and the events leading up to January 6th, the cultivation of deliberate lies, um, the falsification of slates of electors, the enormous pressure that was placed on state and local elected officials who are running our elections, uh, both not just Democrats, but Republicans in positions of leadership in our elections in various places across the country, um, is previously unfathomable and extraordinarily dangerous because it puts f for two reasons. One, because we came so close to seeing the results of a legitimate presidential election overturned because some people could not abide with a thought of ceding power. And two, because it seems that it set a blueprint for 2024, that these lies are still being propagated, that there are still efforts by politicians in some state to choose, not to have the voters choose the politicians, but to have the politicians choose the voters. But even worse, potentially, falsify or overturn the will of the people as cast at the ballot. And that sounds like a conspiracy theory, but you listen to the hearings, you listen to the testimony of Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, a Republican who stood up to a call from the president, from President Trump himself, to falsify the ballots, who did a recount, who looked at the ballots in Georgia and found no discernible fraud. You hear the testimony of local election officials um, who feared for their lives, who had violent mobs invading their homes or their grandmother's home. Um, and I know from personal conversations of secretaries of state who had very real death threats placed against them. Um, and here in Maine, we are not immune. And one of the epidemics that we are seeing in our country is an epidemic of disinformation, misinformation, and malinformation. Misinformation is, I make a mistake. I think that this, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it rained on my wedding day, but my husband takes out the video and shows me it didn't, <laughs> right? That's misinformation. Somehow I've created a story, I believe it to be true, but I'm not actually malicious about it, right? Like it's just, I am misinformed or misremembering. We all do it, right? Like we think we, think we remember something, we're wrong. Sometimes it takes a little prodding from friends and family to demonstrate that we are in fact wrong. I'm never wrong, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> That's misinformation. It's well-intentioned, it's just wrong. Disinformation is the deliberate sowing of lies to influence people, to make them believe a lie, 
and to incentivize a particular action or a particular outcome. And disinformation online has some origins from our foreign adversaries. There is documented evidence of our foreign adversaries sowing disinformation online. But it is not just sown by foreign adversaries. It is also spread deliberately um, by some in power seeking to shape an outcome or influence people, particularly voters. And then malinformation is taking a fact and telling a lie about that fact. So for example, registered voters in Winthrop, and I couldn't tell you how many registered voters there are in Winthrop, but I can tell you that I am sure that in the last year there's some people that have moved out of Winthrop, possibly to Manchester, <laughs> maybe out of state, and did not call the town office and say, hey, <laughs> I'm moving, take me off the voter rolls. It happens all of the time. People are human. Most of us forget to tell our town office that we're moving and please remove us from the voter rolls. So what is malinformation that we see sometimes? People will say, well, so-and-so is registered to vote. That's voter fraud. They don't live there anymore. It's fraud if they still try to vote in Winthrop, even though they've moved to Manchester, and then they vote in Manchester. And if they do that, we will find them, because there are checks and balances. Everyone who votes in the state of Maine, the municipal clerk or the poll workers on election day, enter them in on a list, and then enter that list into the central voter registration system. And we check all of the names to make sure that John Smith doesn't vote in Winthrop in Manchester on election day. And if somebody does vote twice, we will catch them and we'll prosecute them, as we did in 2020 with two people who actually did vote twice. And that's illegal, and we caught them <laughs> because there are checks and balances in the process. But now information is saying because John Smith forgot to call the town office that there's voter fraud in Winthrop. That is just not true. But this is an epidemic. We see it all over the place. Disinformation and malinformation leading to misinformation, innocent people believing lies. And what happens when people believe lies about the election? They target the people they hold responsible, and that is the, the municipal clerks or the county clerks in, in states that do it by county and the state election officials. And we've even seen it here in Maine. Two documented cases of clerks in Maine where people made threats against their um, uh, lives and safety. And that's why we passed election protection legislation this past year um, and made sure that if a clerk is threatened by someone, then that is a crime and it will be investigated and prosecuted by the Office of the Attorney General. Um, but we're not immune here even in our state um, where people are believing lies and then they take it out on the people that they think are responsible. And it's a very, very troubling, troubling um, aspect. So back to your question about the fragility of our democracy and what's happening in other states. Um, it's going to take, um, I will tell you what gives me hope. <laughs> Let's start there. So I am part of the National Association of Secretaries of State. And last summer, um, I was appointed to a bipartisan, four Republican secretaries and four Democratic secretaries, to work on the issue of vote verification. What are the procedures that states use to verify that the vote is accurate? And I'm proud to say we were unanimous in coming up with a list of recommendations, approved best practices, things that we all agreed were what states should do, often do, and should do to verify the vote. So we had these conversations, and they were robust conversations. They were meaningful conversations, and we came together in agreement. The Ohio Secretary of State, Frank LaRose, and I co-chair a national task force on healthy democracy. Again, it's comprised of elected officials from across the country, equal numbers of Republicans and Democrats. And we've been in meaningful conversations about fighting disinformation about civics and what, how we promote civics education um, in voting rights. And we don't find that we always agree, but at our last meeting, they're all virtual. This is one of the wonders of Zoom. Um, they're not all virtual. We had a meeting in person in New Mexico, and we're having another meeting in person in Oklahoma City. But 
in these conversations, you know, we don't always agree, but we've had some very in-depth, very meaningful exchanges. And so that's what gives me hope. And the other thing that gives me hope is that good people did stand up to those threats and those pressure. Because fundamentally, most Americans believe in the strength of the promise of the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. Most Americans want to agree that voting rights should be free, fair, secure, that we should make voting accessible and protect security. These are things that we've always agreed on, and that's what gives me hope. So it's a scary time. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. Um, but I do think we can move th through it. But it requires staying educated, staying engaged, staying, staying informed, and holding people accountable. Um, there are some election deniers running here in our state. There are people who have made public comments um, saying that they don't believe President Biden is our president. Those people do not deserve <laughs> our votes. Um, and so I think, you know, staying educated about what people are saying and holding them accountable for it, regardless if they're somebody that, you know, is fun to have a beer with. <laughs> you know, so. I have, uh, just a sort of a comment or a question, but for the, the next presidential election and the safety of people going to vote. I mean, having heard some of the testimony of what happened in Georgia, you know, who's going to want to work at the polls, whether you're a volunteer or a paid um, poll worker? I mean, what's going to happen to, I mean, this is a nationwide issue, to various states and, you know, having feeling that you can go safely to a poll to vote. You know, you have people who are going to come with guns, you're gonna, you know, what's all gonna happen? And it's, it's sort of a scary situation. Yeah, the question is how do we ensure security at the polls for voters and for election workers? And I, I think this is something that's really important. It's something that we're working on. It's one of the reasons we passed that law at the state level uh, um, to protect our election workers here in our state. Um, security is something we take very seriously. Um, we, you know, if, if a polling location wants a security presence, um, sheriffs or the main state police or the law enforcement at the Secretary of State's office are available to assist towns um, with that and sometimes do. And I think, um, The risks are real. And when I talk to my fellow secretaries whose lives have been threatened, um, I am just in awe because I am well aware of some of the threats that they're not sharing publicly, that they're not telling stories about because they don't want there to be you know, people who imitate um, what they hear about, um, people who have been very much in danger because of the work that they do. But their commitment to democracy, their commitment to our institutions is steadfast. And I have no doubt um, that those leaders will be there in 2024 um, if good people do have the courage to stay involved and not get discouraged and not get, dis not get full of despair and go and cast a vote. I do believe that a majority of people don't want to see election deniers um, elevated to secretaries of state and other positions of power. And so I'm hopeful that people will continue to stay engaged in the process. And I think we can create structures or preserve structures like absentee voting that provide an additional measure of security for people who have genuine concerns about going on election day. Um, and we can have collaborations with law enforcement um, to make sure that there are additional security measures where necessary. But it's real. Yeah. How do you volunteer to become a poll worker? Oh, <laughs> great question. How do you volunteer to be a poll worker? Everyone at home, everyone here in this room should volunteer to be a poll worker. And this is the best way to counter um, disinformation and malinformation. Because once you're a poll worker, you see that it's not one person in the back room tabulating the vote. Everything that is done in elections is done in at least teams of two. and. 
Um, this may not be apparent to every volunteer poll worker, but under Maine law, poll workers have to be equally re represented from the major political parties. So there are equal numbers of Republicans and Democrats at the polling places um, volunteering on election day. That's something that not a lot of folks are aware of. Um, and so I think, um, so there, the, the Maine um, clerks uh, have a website. Um, you can Google Maine volunteer as a poll worker, and there's a website to sign up to be a poll worker or you can call your town office and put your name on the list say you're interested in volunteering as a poll worker on election day they definitely need your help um, because we have seen some poll worker retirements and in the age of covid there are last minute you know when i was touring election sites on election day um, there were people that were out due to COVID and last minute substitutions and you know people doing double shifts because somebody had suddenly become unavailable. So we need your help. Please volunteer to be a poll worker. It's the best way. And I think one of the challenges that we have in this age of disinformation about elections is elections at its best is really voting, uh, really boring. The best part of elections is voting, right? Like that's the exciting part is like filling in the ballot. But but the steps in elections, like setting up the booths so that there is proper security, testing the tabulator machine, which is never connected to the internet, but testing it at the state level and then testing it at the municipal level, having those lists, you know, having those logs. So there are always two people that empty the absentee ballot drop box and, and they're logging it, you know, <laughs> in a log. Checking all your logs, checking all your lists, checking in the voters, entering the data, checking the data. All of it is, is excruciatingly detail oriented, right? <laughs> like, but that's why elections are so secure, because we have like every step in the process is carefully thought out, and there are multiple people involved, and everything is checked more than once, both at the local level and at the state level. So until you volunteer, though, it's hard to get a sense of that. Um, but definitely volunteer. It's a great way to get involved in our democracy. So um, I think, uh, how are we doing on time? Or is there even a specific time? 7.30 now. Okay, perfect. Um, if there's one or two more questions, I'm happy to take them, and then we'll wrap it up, because I know folks have to go. No more questions. Excellent. Well, I just want to thank you. Thank you to the library. So as a kid growing up without electricity or running water, um, <laughs> Hancock didn't ha So we didn't have TV, right? <laughs> we certainly, this was pr before the age of cell phones um, or any other devices. And library, the Sullivan Library was the library my family used because Hancock didn't have um, our own library. So once a week, we got to go to the library and I get to pick out all the books that I wanted and um, that was just so foundational and so important to my education um, and to my exploration to my excitement about the Bill of Rights and my excitement about some of um, you know finding leaders who I could get excited about in history um, and reading those histories uh, so um, and reading all of Anne of Green Gables and <laughs> not just history, but, but some of the good stuff too. Um, so just want to thank the library for hosting me, for having this speaking series, um, because an informed public is also um, a critical, vital, important part of our democracy. The freedom to think, the freedom to read, the freedom to educate ourselves, um, that is uh, so funda fundamentally important um, to a civil society and to our hope for the future. Thank you.